Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service of worship. The Lord be with you. It's good to be with you today uh, on this, the Lord's Day. I think it's the second Sunday of the season of Lent, uh, 40 days, not including weekends, when we're uh, to uh, find time to enter into the wilderness. Uh, maybe some of you are already out there. Uh, and to time of reflection and of transformation. Uh, so, uh, again, welcome to all those who are here this morning as visitors or guests. We're grateful to have you with us as we worship uh, the Lord together. A few announcements as we begin. A reminder that our Lenten study with Mount Joy is continuing this Wednesday here in Fellowship Hall at 6.30 here at St. Paul's. Uh, we are studying Adam Hamilton's uh, series entitled Catch, Catch, uh, which has to do with how do we reach out and invite others into the life of the church. Um, and uh, so this uh, Wednesday, our theme is hospitality. How hospitable are we as a congregation in terms of reaching out and then welcoming and assimilating folks into our common life? So if you, if you, you don't have to come every Wednesday, but if you're available this Wednesday, it would be great to have you. Dinner starts at 6.30. Um, you saw an insert today on the coronavirus. Uh, we have begun to have conversation around what would we do in the event that uh, there is an outbreak in this area. Uh, would we meet as a church? Or um, would David and I and Teresa and others and Rob maybe just uh, put a service on by ourselves and video, have it video, bring Roger and Jen out and... Uh, uh, you could watch it at home. So we're, we're trying to ask some questions. Even it was uh, thought that maybe for the staff's sake, we would send them away to some place secluded and warm away from for, for uh, a month or two. So, uh, but uh, just some common sense things we put here and we are thinking through again other policies in case or procedures if it gets worse. Uh, so I'm gonna, after uh, Sandra, uh, comes up, she has an announcement, and okay, we have a set of keys. Um, Mike Pollock is holding them up in the back. What's attached to that, Mike? A frilly? Anybody recognize them? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, So um, after Sandra comes up and shares a, a couple announcements real quick, uh, we're going to invite you to welcome your neighbor, but we're going to ask you not to shake hands or any kissing this morning, okay? Uh, you know, you can wave or give an elbow, okay? Hi. Good morning, St. Paul's. Uh, we're in our third week of Second Mile Giving, the missions uh, giving that goes beyond our regular giving. And this year, um, oh, there's envelopes in the pews. And this year, those uh, monies will go to three areas. They will go to um, our youth mission trip, which this year is to uh, the Appalachia in Kentucky. And it goes to Kind to Kids, which is a local Delaware ministry that reaches out to foster children. And then also Rise Against Hunger, which is this Saturday. And as I said, you don't have to sign up, but um, we have a link that we'll send this week. You can sign up, and I'm kind of old-fashioned, so if anyone wants to raise their hand now to let me know that they're coming, I will get an idea of, so raise your hands if you're planning on coming. Oh, that's good. Great. Perfect. Okay. I know some of you are already signed up online, so thank you for that. So that's at uh, 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock on Saturday. And we're going to make 14,000 meals. If you're not coming, you should. It's a lot of fun. And you can bring friends. And uh, it's very high energy and very um, fast moving in the sense that we're all doing different parts that culminates into this amazing accomplishment. So thank you very much. And we'll see you on Saturday. And, and, and if uh, there are any folks available at 730, we're unloading the truck and setting up. I think I have four or five volunteers. We're looking for about 10 to come at 730. Let me invite you now again to, to welcome your neighbor from a distance. <laughs>
welcome neighbors. <laughs> Please rise for the call to worship. We will sing of your steadfast love, O God, forever.
thanks for the day that is before us, O oh God, a gift from you, with all of its opportunities of worship and of service, and the ways we have invested our life to please you. Grant that we may pass the hours in this service in the freedom of your, in the freedom of your worship, so that when the evening comes and this day is over, we may again give thanks to you for the ways in which you have sustained and strengthened our lives and set our feet in the direction of service and love. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, St. Paul's. Um, I want to introduce you to our um, UMW board. I'm Debbie um, Demeter. This is uh, Ginger Morley and uh, Jan Hill and Sarah McElvain. Um, each year, uh, local UMW units uh, 
submit donations to the National UMW in honor of two women, uh, both UMW members and churchwide volunteers, whose service is inspirational. We also make a uh, gift in memory donations in honor of those women in our church who have passed away during the year. These donations help to fund the National UMW's mission work on behalf of women, children, and youth around the world. Um, this year, our special mi mission recognition award goes to Ginger Morley, and our gift in mission award goes to Fran Smart. In addition to presenting Ginger and Fran with UMW Awards, we would like to share with you why we feel these women are so worthy of this recognition. Good morning. I first met Fran when we were members of a Sunday evening small group. This group gave me an opportunity to see Fran in action. Fran was involved with the group in her special way, her insight to our Bible studies, sharing her faith, and participating in our group's mission projects of preparing and um, serving meals and interacting with the clients of Friendship House every month. In this group, I learned that prayer was most important to Fran. She prayed for our concerns and shared her con prayers and concerns for her family, her mother who she moved to Delaware and cared for in the last years of her life, her adult children, her grandchildren, and her extended family that she cares for so much. Family, all generations. Recently, Fran took her grandson to Utah to, sprint, to ski. I want to be related to Fran. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. But what has happened is Fran is a person that I greatly admire and who has taught me so much about family and the importance of our church family in our life. The UMW is proud to have this award given to Fran this morning. And yeah, we'll do the bump. The UMW Special Mission uh, Recognition Award offers a meaningful way to honor women who have dedicated so much time and effort to service. Since joining St. Paul's in the 1980s, Ginger Morley has made a commitment of service in many ways. Ginger and Ken joined St. Paul's as they had heard that it would be a wonderful church for their children, Andrew, Chris, and Megan. Ginger became involved in the children's Sunday school program eventually becoming the superintendent. As her children grew older, she went back to work in her career as a home economics educator. Upon her retirement years later, she was once again serving children in vacation Bible school. Ginger's participation in a sharing group at St. Paul's led to years of making, delivering, and eating meals with the homeless once a month at Friendship House. She has always pitched in where needed, be it Meals on Wheels, Substitute, or currently serving as a communion steward and an usher. Out of concern for making our congregation feel cared for, she was instrumental in joining with Pastor Finch and others in forming what is now the Congregational Care Committee. It was through this committee that she met her good friend Libby and began helping her with funeral receptions. After losing Libby to cancer, Ginger has made it her commitment to carry on this service in Libby's honor. Additionally, as part of her hospitality duties, she welcomes visitors to our church by maintaining our visitor table in the Narthex. Ginger is currently serving on St. Paul's UMW board. She's been president once and vice president twice. Under her six-year leadership, UMW has continued to grow both in number and mission service. Living the UMW purpose, Ginger has put her faith, hope, and action uh, into action for the neediest of our community. 
She is passionate in her fight against injustice. Ginger has also been an integral part of the UMW Dep2 circle, offering both her leadership skills and spirituality, keeping us active and engaged. Over the years at St. Paul's, Ginger has been a good friend to many people. She has a gift for bringing people together and making people feel welcomed. Her spirit-led energy is a blessing to us all. Uh, thank you to both Ginger and Fran and to all St. Paul's United Methodist Women for your continued work on behalf of women, children, and youth around the world. And thank you to St. Paul's congregation who continually support all our UMW work in mission. Thank you. you guys get up this morning? Huh? An hour earlier? Uh-oh, at least two did. Okay. Three. I'm sorry, three. That's good. Who was tired this morning? Yeah? You weren't, you weren't tired? You were good? Did you know the time changed? No? Yeah, see. That's good. Excellent. So you get up early anyway. Um, children's message. Oh, wait. By the way, congratulations, ladies. Um, on your, or your recognition and all you, uh, you do. So I wanted to start by talking about another mission opportunity. You may have heard that there's going to be an event on Saturday called Rise Against Hunger. Rise Against Hunger, all right? Sandra just announced, look at her, she's all pumped up. Now let me tell you what Rise Against Hunger is for people that don't know up here and don't know out there. At 7.30, a large truck is gonna pull up. It's gonna have, have hundreds maybe thousands of pounds of rice and soy and, and equipment and all kinds of stuff on that, all right? And this truck is gonna pull up at 7.30 and Sandra is gonna unload that truck. And she's gonna drag all that into the gym and she's gonna set up some tables and the tables are gonna have bins and she's gonna pour the rice into the bins and she's gonna set up some tables and they're gonna have weighing machines and things to seal bags in, okay? And then she's gonna lay all this out, and what's gonna happen next is she's gonna take a bag, and she's gonna put some rice and some soy and some other dry vegetables in it, and a packet, and a packet. Then she's gonna take it over to a machine, and she's gonna weigh it. And if it's not exactly the right weight, she's gonna add a little rice, or she's gonna take a little rice out. Then. Then she's going to seal it with a bag, seal the bag, and then put it into a box, right? And then she's going to do all that 13,999 more times. That's going to take a while. That's exactly correct. But she won't be done yet. Then she's going to pack all that up in a box and take it back into the truck and then the truck's gonna pull away. She's gonna clean up whatever mess she made so that the coffee fellowship can happen the next day, right? And then Sandra will be done. That's gonna take, that's a big job, isn't it? That is a big job. She should sit down, she needs some rest, you know, to get ready for that, yeah? She's gonna, well, that's, what I want to talk about today, right? That sort of big job reminds me of our scripture today, which is in Exodus chapter 4. And we've been talking about Moses and Exodus, right? And so Moses was saved from the Pharaoh the week one. I think Pastor Dave gave week one, right? Did you? Okay. He's dead. He doesn't remember. That was two weeks ago. And then last week, last week, Moses encountered God on a mountain, in a burning bush, and God said to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people, and I want you to lead them out of Egypt. 
Now, do you know how many people we're talking about? I think the Bible says there were 600, more than 600,000 men. So that could mean that I've heard numbers of two, up to 2 million people. God, you want me to lead 2 million people out of Egypt? Well, well, so first he said, well, how do I know they'll listen to me? And this is not in the scripture. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, tell them that God sent you. And he said, well, what if they don't listen to that? And he said, well, take your staff and throw it down and turn it into a snake and then pick it up. They'll listen to that. And if they don't listen to that, take your arm and stick it in your shirt. And when he pulled it out, it had, it had leprosy all over it. It was all sick. And then he put it back in and he pulled it out and it was well. And he said, they'll listen to that. And I think I also told him one more thing. I think it was, a, if you take water and drop it on the ground, it turns to blood. And so if you list, do all these things, they will listen to you. Uh, that was Noah. That's Noah. This is a different guy. So anyway, he said, uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm not sure I can do that. That is too big of a job. And so God said, all right, I'm going to give you one more thing. How about I give you Aaron a helper? How about I give you a helper? And you know what? When he heard he had a helper, he said, sure, I'll do it, right? Helpers are important, right? And so Aaron shows up and Aaron says, yep, I'll help you do this. Uh, I'll help you speak to the people. I'll help you lead them. And so they go on, and I won't tell you the rest of the story, right? But the important part of this story is it's about being God's helper, right? Are you guys helpers? Occasionally? Yeah, right? Well, God calls leaders, and God calls helpers. And guess what? The helpers are just as important as the leaders. Because if the helpers don't show up, whatever God needs, eh, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be a lot on Sandra. Two weeks, maybe two weeks to do this by herself, right? And the truth is, I don't really think she can do it by herself. I think really it's going to take me to show up and give her a hand, right? And maybe you guys also, right? You're coming? Okay. All right. All right. And I think I did see some names. I think I saw some hands. The other people are coming, right? And so it's really important when we hear God's call, whether we're leaders or whether we're helpers, whether it's a big job or whether it's a little job, that the most important thing is that we are obedient and we respond to God's call. All right? We got that? Yeah. Oh, this is a good message. We both get it. All right. All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for using us in your jobs and your work. We ask that we would be obedient to your call and that we would respond always to the call of help, that we would do this all in Jesus' name so that you would receive the glory and the honor. Amen. Thanks for being here.
please join me in hymn 2176, In Faith We Sing, Make Me a Servant. that we may gather and include in our prayer this morning light moments, bright moments that you just can't keep to yourself. Yes, here's one right here. Did you hear that? Grace is here. A little early, but here nevertheless. Thanks be to God for new life. Into this wondrous world of wonders, one more one. Thank you, Ken. Yes, funny. Finn, three operations. And he's home. And seven weeks old. God is good. Finn. Thanks be to God for Finn. Yes. Sandra? Oh, we're glad you survived. Thanks for sharing. God is good. You didn't say that right. God is good. All the time. Yes.
Well, thanks for sharing your good news with us. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow. The incredible lightness of being. Yes, Joseph. Welcome. Thank you, Joe. You look a lot better. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being here. Yes. I'm glad I'm here today. I'm always get, I always get confused on, I have to get up at 2 in the morning and set my clock up, and it, it just messes up my sleep. But. All right. Yes. Somebody else is, I can't see Poor Chris, with migraines in the hospital, Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Fran. This is the Methodist Church in Putney. Christian Missionary Alliance, yes. Well, for this church and for Fran's son in law, who's the pastor, and the Lord in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes. The tornado victims in Nashville, Lord in your mercy. Yes. Who is? Rick Stout. Yes, Rick Stout is still in the hospital, isn't he? I saw him on uh, Friday or Saturday, I think, and he was, he was Rick. Ready to go, but trapped in a bed that didn't let him move to a, His surgical procedure, though, was considered to be successful. So let us keep Rick in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. For this day, Lord, we give you grateful thanks for this opportunity to share what we feel in our hearts as blessings, as interventions that are unexplainable, but that keep us going, and keep us believing, and keep us working in a way that allows the mystery of your healing and strengthening and leading presence to work through us. In the world in which we live, here is your church, raising prayers for people who have been victimized by storms, raising your prayers for people who are subject to the onslaught of pathogens that cause disease that cannot be explained. Wherever, O oh God, we pray, there is the need for your reassurance and divine mercy. We raise our prayers this morning mindful and thankful for the way in which you have worked in our lives in the past and promised to be with us as we go forward with you in the future. Thank you for this church and its ministry for this time together today. Bless, we pray, the plans that are made and the activities that are provided to enable us to be one in Christ and one in ministry to all the world. We pray in the name of Christ who has taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. worship with the giving of our morning offering, remembering that uh, God loves a cheerful giver. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. He loves an uncheerful giver also, but especially, especially cheerful givers. Let us pray together. Lord, we give you today what is already yours. You provide so much for us. Blessings pressed down, shaken together, running over. Thank you for giving us the ability to give and cheerful hearts to do it. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in our hymn of preparation. Lord, speak to me.
Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with you with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, O Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff, which will show, shall perform the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, St. Paul's. It is a privilege to be in this pulpit sharing God's word with you. Thank you for your kindness. Let us pray. Father God, it is good to be in your house, fellowshipping with you and with each other. Open our minds and hearts to what your Holy Spirit has for us. Thank you. Amen. When Pastor Dave explained to me that we would be covering the major events in the book of Exodus this month and that he had divided the 40 chapters among us, I instantly thought, that's a lot of material to cover in 20 minutes. He then explained to me that he had given me chapter 4 only. But it was only after reading chapter 4 a few times that I decided that one chapter was definitely a fair division of labor. God had a plan to liberate his people from the slavery they had suffered under for four, over 400 years. He had heard their cries, he had seen their rage, and he was moved to free them from that horrible situation. God had a plan, and he had a man who could bring his people out from under Pharaoh's dominion. Moses met God at a, bone, at a burning bush after living in the backside of a desert for 40 years. And he told, God told Moses that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that he had seen the way his people, Abraham's descendants, were being oppressed and suffering under the hands of their Egyptian masters. God's next words must have flabbergasted Moses. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. God told Moses that he would not be going to Egypt alone, that he, God, would be with him. To say that Moses was reluctant to return to Egypt is an understatement. His first question was, but well, what if I go to Egypt and tell them that the God of their forefathers sent me, what if they do not believe me? Moses seemed to be overly concerned and even afraid of others' opinions and reactions. God explained to Moses in great detail what was going to happen when he went to his people. He even assured Moses that the Israelites would leave Egypt with great plunder given to them willingly by the Egyptians. After all that, Moses still did not believe and he was still reluctant. And God said to him, what is in your hand? And Moses answered, a staff. He was then told to throw the staff onto the ground where it turned into a snake and he ran from it. I would have run from it. God told him that if the people would not pay attention to these signs, then he was to take water from the Nile River and pour it on the ground and where it would turn into blood. The staff and the blood to be, were to be important signs to both the Israelites and the Egyptians. All of the pharaohs before him and after him carried gold staffs 
as a symbol of authority. Even with all of God's assurances, Moses did not give up his reluctance to go back to Egypt. He complained to the Lord that he had never been an eloquent man of speech, that he was slow of tongue, and he was slow of tongue. And God asked Moses two questions. Who made man's mouth? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, second time he tells him. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Moses wasn't finished yet. He said, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. The Lord had finally had enough and he became angry with Moses and said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. You speak to him and put words in his mouth and I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Aaron will speak to the people for you and it will be as if it were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. God most likely wanted Moses to be recognized as having authority even though it was only a staff made of wood and not gold. Moses finally obeyed. He went back to his house, took his wife and his two sons, put them on a donkey, and headed for Egypt. Aaron and Moses did what God had assigned them to do. They freed the people from Egypt. Now Moses had grown up in the court of Pharaoh. He had been raised and supported by Pharaoh's sister. He had been given the finest education to be had in the world. He had left Egypt dressed as an Egyptian and speaking both Egyptian and Hebrew. And he returned there looking like Hebrews and speaking Hebrew and Egyptian. So upon what was his reluctance based? What was he, of what was he afraid? Not being recognized, I think, since it had been 40 years since he had left Egypt or fled Egypt running for his life after killing an Egyptian man. Maybe he was afraid of making a fool of himself. Is that not what most of us are sometimes afraid of? Looking foolish? Is it not what keeps us from going forward into new opportunities, new horizons, new adventures? But many of God's people in the Bible were not afraid of doing what their faith told them was the right thing to do. Just a few examples. God told Abraham to leave his home country and his people and go to the land of Canaan, later renamed Israel. 4,000 years later, and his descendants are still living in, Egypt, in um, Israel. Now, David went to a sword fight with a giant carrying a slingshot and five smooth stones. The giant lost the fight and his head. In one of the most beautiful stories of the Bible, Ruth, a Moabite, a foreigner, after the death of her husband, went with her mother-in-law to Israel and would later become the great-grandmother of King David and the 30th great-grandmother of King Jesus. I had to look up those uh, generations in the book of Matthew. Jesus, without fear, willingly went to Jerusalem, knowing that he would be arrested and put to death. He went anyway. He willingly allowed himself to be up, offered up on the cross as, a, as the blood sacrifice his father in heaven had prepared for the world and for the forgiveness of all of mankind's sins. History is filled with men and women who, possibly reluctant at first, chose to do what they had to do, what they knew was the right thing to do, no matter the cost. They obeyed and they went to do what needed to be done. Reflecting back on having to assume the role of president after the unexpected death of President Franklin Roosevelt, Vice President Harry Truman remarked, 
that he had been in the right place at the wrong time. He did the job he had not expected to be in, and if he wasn't exactly loved, he was respected, at least enough to get elected on his own merits in 1948. And reluctant at first, I wonder if General George Washington had also thought that he had been in the right place at the wrong time when he was asked to take control of the Continental Army and then later become president of the first president of the United States. Still, it did not stop him. He went and won a war that nobody outside of America and France thought, thought he could, and he later helped to steer a young nation. John Hancock was a very wealthy man probably the wealthiest man in the 13 colonies. He had a lot to lose by supporting the American side against the British. But he decided that he might as well sign the declaration in very large script so that others could see where he stood. If he was afraid, he went and did the right thing anyway. And if you notice down towards the bottom right, Ben Franklin wrote his in, in large script, not as big as Hancock's, but it was big. Ben Franklin told the delegates to the, uh, in Constitution Hall that if they did not hang together in their endeavor, they would all be hanged separately by the British. We should all have that kind of determination. God whispers to us through scriptures, books, other people, sermon, sermons, a yearning heart, and even dreams. One of the loudest whispers is on the subject of the redemption of mankind, the redeem, redemption of Israel from Egypt's slavery, and the redemption of the world through the blood of Jesus has been his top priorities all through all generations. Some of the great, none of the great men and women of history was perfect. In fact, some of them had serious deficiencies of character. But God used them anyway. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. He used Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, Cotton Mather, Billy Graham, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Beecher Stowe, John Bunyan, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and tens of millions of others, we probably don't know their names. Some, and it, many of them were reluctant at first, but they placed their faith in God's hands and some laid down their lives for the redemption of their fellow man. Others spent time in jail for their beliefs and their actions, and quite a few of them never walked out of those jails. God used Moses and gave him a helper, Aaron, and he wants to use you too. As he was with them, he promises to be with you. He will give you the opportunities to share the gospel you know with those who do not know his power to redeem. And you have all the gifts you need. The Holy Spirit is within. It is the word of God which brings people out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Forty years ago, I was at the Wilmington Skating Club, sitting at a table, having a cup of coffee and waiting for my son's ice skating lesson to be finished when a woman I had never seen before walked up to my table and stated, you look like you've lost your best friend. After all these years later, and I am still amazed that I did not tell her to get lost or worse. Instead, I invited her to sit down. My life was about to change forever. I had not admitted it and refused to recognize it, but God had been pursuing this prodigal daughter. 
He evidently had had enough of my long lost interest in him. It took one woman who listened to God's instructions, who cared enough about my spiritual condition and my destination to show me God's love and good purposes for me. She and several other women showered God's love on me, but still reluctant, I took another six weeks before I said yes to God and to his redemption of my soul. The world needs you. Its people need to see the light that you have and the hope of salvation and redemption you carry. You can be the voice of freedom to those who are lost. They can be found. And like Moses, God commands you to go and set the captives free and then allow them to see Jesus in you. When Moses asked, who am I that I should go to Egypt? God answered him by telling him who he, God, is. I am. I am with you. I am your helper. I am going before you. I am beside you. Do not be afraid. I am what you need me to be. Sometimes our actions are louder than words. St. Francis is quoted as having admonished Christians, if necessary, use words. He meant, I think, that what we do is louder than what we say. John Wesley is famous for his exhortation to do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, and all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. You will not be alone. God, the great I am, is with you. Today is called to discipleship. Let us use our words and our actions to bring the lost and hurting into God's plan of redemption. We are the bearers of the good news of the gospel. Friends, please rise as we join together in singing our closing hymn, Sent Forth by God's Blessing.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord make his face turn toward you and give you peace. Amen.